Welcome to Joy. So glad you can be with us today. Praise the Lord. We have, uh, I've been thinking about, Jack and I have been talking about doing a study in Revelation. And uh, it's a it's a difficult study to do on Sundays, honestly, because if you don't have a handle on Ezekiel and Daniel and Joel and some of Isaiah and Matthew, and there's just so much, if you don't have a handle on that, it's really hard to sort out everything that's there. <clears throat> but the um, been, Lord's been laying it on my heart and uh, then decided to started in November, and all this stuff took place in Israel, or is taking place in Israel, in the Middle East. That's bringing up a lot of uh, conversation. Um, so I, I want to go through it. I don't know how long it'll take. I said in the first service, a good study of Revelation probably take about six years on Sundays. But uh, we're going to try to get it done in you know by spring. Uh, there are you know, 21 chapters after all. So there's a lot there. But in the weeks leading up to that, I want to look at false teachers. Because there is so much false out there today. The world is just filled with it. Now, it was the same in Jesus' day, but we are bombarded in a different way in our culture. We have all of the you know, the social media, we have the media that, the, the, whether it be news or whether it be talk shows or whatever it is, we have so many things out there, the newsprint, and so much of that is just false or just so skewed. And, and I'm not blaming liberals or, or conservatives. Both sides are doing it. It's just really hard to know what's truth. And uh, we struggle with that here in the, in the scriptures many times, or in the churches, because false teachers are here as well, just as they were in Peter's day. Now, I want you to understand, as we go through this passage in 2 Peter 2, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, this passage is not about those false religions that are teaching other gods. The humanism that teaches that man is his own God, okay? Uh, or the others like Islam or Hinduism or Satanism or Buddhism or animism or any of the myriad of others that are out there. This is not talking about them. If you know even a fraction of what the Bible has to say, you know they're wrong, okay? This is about those who call themselves Christian, who maybe even are Christian, claiming to teach the Bible, but they're distorting its truth and its power for their own purposes and not God's. There's a lot of that surrounding the end time events as well. I don't spend time, if you've been around here very long, you know I don't spend time talking about other religions. I am of the opinion that if you know what is right, when the false stuff's put in front of you, you'll recognize it. But today, because of this study, I want to mention a few. There are men such as the father, one considered the father of the modern-day faith movement, E.W. Kenyon, who claims to be as much an incarnation as the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Rather, David Koresh-ish, right? Kenneth Copeland, who is still out there, he stated that Satan conquered Jesus on the cross, that Christ is an emaciated, poured out, little wormy spirit, and that God is on the outside looking in, and in order to have any say on the earth, is going to have to be in agreement with a man here. How do you say you preach an almighty God and make a statement like that? He goes on to say the biggest 
failure in the Bible is God. Leading multitudes. Receiving donations and <laughs> from people all over the world. <clears throat> Benny Hinn, you've all heard his name too. After stating that women were designed to actually give birth out of their sides, he made this statement. I am a little God. I am a little Messiah. Now we are known as little Christ because we follow him, but to say that I'm God, that I'm a Messiah, no, our mission is to lead people to the Messiah. We are not the Messiah. Men like Charles Capps, who denies the pre-existence of Christ, claims the reason people die around 70 instead of 900 as before the flood is that we, unlike them, we make statements like, I'm just dying to do that, or that just tickled me to death, saying that our words are so powerful they're causing us to die 130 years before the people before the flood. <clears throat> These are the originators of many of today's movements under the banner of Christianity. Then you add all the false doctrines of the many mainstream denominations that are embracing the very things God says he abhors and that he'll judge. And it's no surprise the world is in the state that it's in today. We are not to fall prey to these false prophets. We are to know the truth to set us free from that, but to be able to recognize those that are involved in it and leading people in these truly false religions. When you say Christ wasn't pre-existing, you're saying he's not really God. But you are? I mean, that's scary. <clears throat> we are not to hate these people. Our job isn't even to fight them. Our job is to be the light of the world. Our job is to recognize this false teaching. And our job is then to show people that the love of God, the grace and the mercy of God will give us the peace that we need in these troubled times and the strength and the courage we need to do the right things in the most difficult times of life to be the light of the world. We do not fellowship as a church with those that have twisted the doctrine. I do not believe we're supposed to. I've been invited to stand on the same platforms with some of them and pray to different gods. <clears throat> can't do that because at that point I begin to give my consent to what they're doing. But neither am I to hate them, to seek to destroy them, but to let them see the light of Jesus. In 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom 
The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you. Father, as we come before you, we pray that that Holy Spirit that you've given each one of us who is a true believer, Lord, he will give us understanding. Burn your words in our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, not only to know the words, but to understand them by your great power, by your Holy Spirit's guiding. Then more than that, Lord, to put them into practice in our lives. To be able to see the error in so many people's teaching. Lord, that we might avoid the pitfalls of it, but that we also might have answers, Lord, for those that are seeking truth and are confused by all of this that surrounds us. Empower us today, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> when we talk about false doctrines, they're here today. You know, I mentioned denominational things, and many times these people preach Christ and Him crucified. But then they adhere to and they support things that God says He hates. So there's something wrong in that. Now, it's one thing to not condemn people and reach out to them who are in sin. It's another to try to include it in your doctrines and say, oh, God didn't really mean that. And so that's where we have to figure out what we're to do. He calls them damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. We heard that from one of these men. He cannot be the almighty, eternal God if he didn't exist prior to everything else. Secretly, stealthily, destructively. They used the word, he used the word pernicious. That means ruinous ways that lead to damnation. These heresies, this word's also translated sects in the Scripture. So you have religions that are separated into different divisions by their belief systems, which do not line up with the Scripture. And they're all over Christianity. They're even in lots of different Baptist churches. You know, people talk about Baptist whatever, and I say, that's great, but you know, Baptists are kind of like Heinz 57. There's all kinds of them out there, okay? Just because there's a name on a sign doesn't mean you know exactly what they believe. You have to find out. But those sects, those heresies, are listed in Galatians 5.20 as the works of the flesh. Destructive self-serving doctrines that divide not just men from God, but Christian from Christian. And that's a problem because we need each other. And it's going to get worse. We're going to need each other more and more. As we go through Revelation, you'll begin to understand what I'm talking about there. It says, beware of those Christians whose faith is based on their own ideas and feelings and what they think is right, not on God's Word. That is at the root of everything that we're talking about. I just found that. I like that quote. It helps us understand a little bit that these false teachers, the majority of them, are doing this through covetousness. They want what somebody else has. Fame, fortune, power, following, whatever it is. And it says they do it with feigned words. The feigned words is from this word, plastos, 
Guess what word we get from it? Plastic. Okay? It's fake stuff. You can have plastic wood, but it's not wood. It's fake, right? And on and on and on. It is a counterfeit. It is molded for a specific purpose. We mold plastic into things that make us feel good because it looks like something that's natural. But it lasts and it's good and it's, you know, has takes less care, something like that. What, what the scripture here is saying using a word like that is they mold their words so carefully so that it uses a little bit of truth and it looks on the surface like it's real, but in truth it is rooted in selfishness and selfish desires. It's counterfeit, it's deceptive. And the words, it says, they may, by their words, they make merchandise of you. <clears throat> I, it was a long time ago when they first used that terminology about, you know, if something is free, then you are the product. You know, we see that today. We understand that fully. If you look at the Internet and you look at the, the Googles and the Amazons and the you know, all of these people who collect all of your information nonstop. And we say, well, that's okay because I like what they're doing. I like the ads they give me. I like all of those things. But they are actually making their real money, giving you something by selling all they know about you to somebody else. And that same thing is what the Scripture all of these millennia ago, okay, said that false teachers do with you when they're leading you astray. They're leading you astray not to lead you to a place of hope and benefit, but to benefit themselves. They make it sound good, look good, but it's not truth. Therefore, it will end in disaster in the end. <clears throat> in verses 4 through 9, it talks about judgment is coming. And here, the Holy Spirit, the Peter, Right, the false prophets, these false teachers, and their followers will be judged. And in verse 4 he says, you know the angels that fell when Satan said, hey, follow me instead of God? God made a special place for them, Tartaru, from Tartarus, and it, it is the deepest part of hell with chains. And he says, if God is going to hold those angels accountable for going against him, don't you think he's going to hold these false prophets accountable too? And whoever follows them. Because it wasn't just Satan that was cast out, it was all the angels. Okay. In verse 5 he says, you know when all the humans turned against God and God wiped out all of humanity except for eight people with a flood, God held them accountable. Don't you think he's going to hold these guys accountable? In verse 6, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, all, all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, if they had turned their back on righteousness and they were hateful against all these things godly, which if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, who they were, they look like America today. Okay? And that's, that's no joke. And he rained fire and brimstone down on them. He said, I'm going to hold them accountable. In verse 7 and 8, though, he says, even just Lot was vexed by all the evil. What's that mean? Lot was a man who believed in God. He had lived his life for God. He was doing the right things for the right reasons all along. And then he gets down into Sodom and there's so much corruption that it vexed his spirit. It put him in positions he was unable to deal with. And he did some horrible things, like he even offered his virgin daughters to those abusers so they wouldn't abuse the angels. I mean, what kind of a father would do that? The good news we get from that is in verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the righteous and punish the unjust. 
If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, if you've asked him into your heart today, that's the terminology we use because we're after the crucifixion. No matter how far you fall into this world or no matter how far you get into these false doctrines and follow these false teachers, God still says, wait, that one's one of mine. Before I destroy it, I'm going to deliver him. You're not going to lose your salvation because you really screwed up and went down a wrong path. Praise God for that. But he suffered greatly. And his family suffered greatly because of those decisions. When he describes false prophets in verses 10 and 11, he says they walk in the flesh. What's that mean? He says they walk in the flesh in lust. They despise government. They're presumptuous. Their self-willed speak evil of dignities, even do things that the angels would not dare to do. Now, what's the most popular thing to do in America today? Talk bad about everybody. And you can make good money at it. We are not to support False policies, false doctrines, false, all of those things. But it's not our job to fight them. Jesus came to this earth at a time when Israel, God's chosen people, were under oppression. They were being occupied by Rome, by the Romans. And Jesus was on a mission. It was not to conquer Rome. It was not to deliver Israel politically. It was not to fix all of the situations that were going on, the servitude and the slavery and the abuses. It was to fulfill God's calling on his life at that moment to live the perfect life, preach the word, and then to suffer and bleed and die and be resurrected so that we can celebrate Deliverance, like we will today. He said they're driven by the flesh like brute beasts, and they'll be destroyed. Now, see, God looks at things on the timeline that's so far different than ours. A lot of times we say, but wait a minute. They've been in this stuff for 40 years. They've made tons of money. They're popular, all these things. When's God going to judge them? They're going to stand before God one day. And if they really believe half of the things that they're preaching, they probably aren't saved, and their judgments are waiting at the white throne judgment and a fiery pit. If they do believe that Jesus is God and they ask him to be their Savior, they're still going to suffer loss. They're not going to have anything to show for a lifetime of service because they were serving self, not God. But if they were saved, they'll still go to heaven. How many people will they mislead in the meantime? We're going to go back into chapter 1 for a moment. Second. Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 19, where Peter writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, we have a more sure word. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. He said at the beginning of this passage, he says, we don't follow these cunningly devised fables. We're not teaching you some plausible fiction to get you to follow us. This is actually the word of God. In fact, he says, I'm an eyewitness of it. So we have God, the Holy Spirit, inspiring Peter, who was an eyewitness to so many things, and the one he uses here is the transfiguration of Christ. 
This is when Jesus Christ takes three men up on the mount, and they get to see him. I mean, Jesus was wholly human and holy God. W-H-O-L, okay? Holy, completely. But what they saw in his flesh looked like everybody else. What they saw in his behavior stood out, but what they saw in his flesh looked like everybody else. So he took them up and he says, I'm going to show you what it looks like, what I look like when I'm in heaven. And he gave them this glorified picture. And after six days, Matthew 17, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, bringeth him up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as light. Yet, uh, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Here we have Peter, one of the close disciples, apostles, he was probably there at the baptism of Jesus when the Spirit descended like a dove and they heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son, okay? He is on the Mount of Transfiguration, gets to see the perfect Jesus in glowing in his righteousness, shining as a light, you know, the holy city Jerusalem, it says, They'll be there and there'll be no need for a sun because God will shine as a light, okay? He saw those things. He said, I'm an eyewitness of that. And I had all these feelings. I mean, they said, man, we got to build extra tabernacles and we got to do all these things. And Jesus said, no, you're missing the point. But he said, I was there. I saw it. And man, was it an emotional experience. But you know what? We have a more sure word of prophecy than an eyewitness and account, than an emotional experience, than something else, anything else you can think of. More sure, a steadfast word of prophecy. The word means the expression. The word is logos. If you put in the scripture, when they put the definite article, the, the word, it speaks of Jesus. The express image of God. He says, you do well if you take heed to the word of God. The only wise thing to do when it comes to the Word of God is obey it. God's never wrong. And He wrote His Word. He promised to preserve it for us. We have it in a form that we can understand. Now He says, you need to study it. And then you need to obey it. If you know God by studying his word, if you know what he says is right and what he says is wrong, as soon as these false prophets, these false teachers start saying something that is off track, you'll say, wait a minute, that is not what the Bible says. I have been so pleased down through the years. We started, you know, I spent my whole life in church, and I've watched these people come in trying to take churches, trying to, you know, put false doctrine in, do all that my whole life. And our discipleship program, I want to give you some information on that. Our discipleship program has paid benefits you can't imagine. Because we have had a number of times where people have come in to spread false religion, to try to take the church, to try to do all those things, and you didn't hear about it, because the people who went through discipleship, as soon as they started quoting scriptures and telling them what it meant, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that is not what the scripture says. 
You know how they knew? Because they went through discipleship and they read the Bible and they learned it and they memorized it and they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What you're saying doesn't match up with what the Bible says. And so all of that false teaching and all of those things, I didn't have to bring it to the pulpit and make a big issue of it because you who have been through discipleship knew enough Bible to say, wait a minute, that's not true. You got to stop this. And so I didn't have to make a big deal out of all those false teachings. That's the way it's supposed to work. Any issue I have to bring here becomes a big problem in the church. You are the church, not this place, by the way. It becomes a big problem for you. And the Word of God sets you free from all of that. But I don't know enough. Nobody knows enough, okay? It's a lifelong process. But just keep studying. And I'll tell you what I've seen God do for me. If I was doing my devotions and I was preparing for the classes or doing whatever that I was doing through my entire life, now I'm talking about back in the car dealerships and everything else, when something would come up, God would have already given me what I needed to deal with it. Now, if I wasn't, I was slacking off and not doing what I was supposed to be doing, sometimes I would be broadsided and I'd say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Is this true? What's happening? You get back in the Word and you find out what the truth is and it's real easy to recognize the counterfeit. He says it's like a light in a dark place. So we need to take the Word of God with us and we need to keep going back to it to prove to ourselves and to everyone around us that what's being taught is truth or false. And then he says, until the day dawn, uh, until the, the dawn when the day star, the sun, I believe the S-O-N, arise in your heart says that there comes this place when the Word of God is so sure to you that you don't doubt it anymore. And he says there is no supernatural experience you can have, no feeling that moves you that can ever be trusted above God's Word. And that's one of the things that's being taught so much. Oh, I had a feeling and it just it had to be the Holy Spirit and He told me to do this. We have heard murderers say that God told them to do it. You know? And we know that's not true. Why are people so easily misled by the false teaching? Because they do not study the Bible for themselves. They depend on others to do it for them. And it's not the same. Do we need the preaching of the Word of God? Yes, the Scripture says so. Should we be in the Sunday school classes and the small groups and all that? Yes, because we glean so much. We also need to be in it on our own. We need to be discipling others. We need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God so that we're constantly being refreshed in it and, and learning more and understanding it so that when something comes up, we can tell it's God or it's not. You see, every true believer has the Holy Spirit of God to give them understanding when they study to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth from 2 Timothy. You know, there's a couple things you need to really understand. If you are an actual believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted Him as Savior, you've asked Him to be your Savior, the Bible says He already gave you His Holy Spirit. You're getting all the Holy Spirit you're ever getting because He's got you and you've got Him. Now, you have to learn to surrender to Him. I understand that. okay? But you've got Him. And He is the one that gives us understanding of the Word of God. But He says the reason we study to show ourselves approved unto God is to be a workman. It's so that we go to work for Him. So that our lives now follow His teaching. Our, our paths of life, yes, they, they sometimes 
don't make sense to us. But if we're looking for opportunity and we're there and we're understanding, even when we go through difficult times, there may be somebody God wants us to reach or something we need to learn or preparation for what is to come. And when we get in Revelation, you're going to see there is some horrible stuff to come. I pray we're right with the pre-tribulation rapture because that would keep us out of most of it, right? But how many Christians down through the ages have had to face the fire, the guillotine, the sword, prison. We don't know what we'll have to face before the Lord comes. But we need to know His Word. We're going to look at false teachers again next week, another part of it, but we need to recommit ourselves to the study of the Word of God. If you've never been in discipleship, you need to get in it. If you've been through discipleship, you need to be discipling somebody else. And I am so encouraged. We had 10 more people go through uh, the leadership training, the Discipleship 3, recently this this year. And uh, in that, we spent a huge amount of time learning how to study, how to discern doctrine, where to take it from, what to watch out for, so many things about the Scripture. It's really, really, really important. So today, what I encourage you to do is to recommit yourself to God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, recommit yourself to the study of His Word, to working for Him, finding your place to use your gifts to to be the light of the world. And if you're here today without Jesus, none of this is available to you until you can understand, trust Him, believe, and ask Him to be your Savior. Heavenly Father, as we come before you...